This changes everything. Like, you know, the language they gave it to and the kind of ease, because it does, it seems like, do I need to be a chemist to be able to eat right or whatever? I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to get another job just learning how to eat <laughs> right. fucking right, you know? And, and then it becomes a thing that you're like, oh, it's kind of like learning a, a stretch or like what we're talking about downstairs about mm -hmm. the way you're learning... Um, Bodybuilding, yeah. Yeah, about 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 new modes of motion. Like you need to be at this depth, and it doesn't matter if 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 this comes up or whatever the thing is. But until I feel the thing, I don't ever know how to put that into my body. And I think right. the same thing with like ketosis is that thing. If I'm not 100 percent disciplined, I don't ever really get to feel like what that's like that people are talking about. Right. You know, you ever check your ketones and stuff? I like don't, that? man. That's another yeah. thing I I'd, I'd like to get into. But then there's been some. Well, this test is bonk, or this test is hard. Uh, yeah. And all that kind of stuff. So I just haven't, I haven't delved into that. But uh, my next phase here, um, going into ketosis, I want to start to mark that, and I want to yeah. have a diary of it. It'd be the first time I've endeavored that since like 2008 or something. So yeah, it's kind of cool to to check them because then it keeps you in check. And then from a perspective of, uh, you know, how many carbs and stuff, then you start to really learn. You're like, whoops, that kind of bumped me. Right. It kind of bumped me over the edge. And even if it's not that accurate of a count, at least it's a count. I always say that about calories too. Like, I don't think that calories, you know, it is calories in calories out to some extent, but calories are, they're not a great measure, but they're the only measure that we have. And so you got to kind of adhere to them somewhat. You can't just eat as much as you want and lose weight. It right. doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You're going to have to move around a bunch and you're going to have to figure out a way eventually for people that are bigger and people that are heavier that have been watching this podcast for a long time. I've been teaching for a long time is you're going to have to eventually figure out a way to make some changes to where you just eat less. Yep. Eat, what's what's eat your less than what you used to eat. Do you know what your biggest and heaviest listener is? <clears throat> uh, you know, we got some, we got some big boys out there. I know that I I've, uh, have met a lot of people that lost over. I mean, cause pounds. I know you, yeah, you're in the world. Yeah. I, we, I'm, you know, met a lot of people that have lost over a hundred pounds, uh, from listening to this show. I myself have lost a hundred pounds. I was 330 pounds. Yeah. My uh, sister-in-law sent me a picture today of me like munching on some giant chocolate chip cookie. And I was about 320 pounds in the picture. What year was that? Uh, you know, it was probably between Oh nine and 2012. Um, the internet, you know, the internet knows kind of the fat Mark Bell. What the funny thing about that story is that I wasn't that big for that long. You know, right. it, it was for a few years, but it was also a little bit of on and off because I knew that those weren't good places to hang out in. Right. It wasn't a good idea to be over 300 pounds. Well, I, so. I remember meeting you and then you were a lot bigger and then you got just shredded and then you got big again, not as big and then shredded not. And now again. Right. And, uh, that kind of thing, is that a thing that if I want to put size on, is that the thing where it's like, well, calories in is all we're thinking about, yeah. more calories in, get as big as you can, and then, I mean, that that's the big thing, right? It's right. like I want to put on mass, then I'm going to cut. Some is that it, a necessary yeah. thing, or is there a healthy way to do that where I'm like, no, I'm just working towards lean yeah. mass? There's... When when you're, uh, you know, getting on the edges of some, of, of anything... Uh, you're riding a fine line and it's not never that like healthy, you know? And that, ultimately that's what I started to recognize. And ultimately that's why uh, I retired from powerlifting. It was just because like, I, I can't keep doing this. I keep going up and down. I know that being heavy is not great for me. Uh, so that's why I keep losing weight. That part makes sense. But then I keep regaining the weight back because I'm obsessed with powerlifting. And I want these numbers. I want to bench 600 pounds. Uh, but then I keep tearing shit and it's just not, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem, doesn't seem to make sense anymore. And as I was like learning more, I started to poke around and investigate more and I got some blood work done and the blood work was bad. I'm like, none of this makes any sense. I'm not any closer to my goal really. And I'm big and I'm fat and my blood work is telling me I'm not healthy. I don't feel very healthy. So these are all really bad signs. I was like, I need to, I need to change. I need to really make a big change. I need to, you know, not just drop weight and get in shape for a couple pictures or whatever. I need to actually like kind of kiss the old self goodbye almost and say, Hey, we're going to do it this way from now on. That's did that, was that, was that, um, that shift? Like how did, how did that land on your family? Like wife and kid are they like, yeah. listen, we're not going to really, we're happy how we're eating, bro. Or was there, I mean, was there a shift in your home? Yeah. You know, some of that, that kind of stuff hasn't really bothered anybody, uh, that much except for the most current 
shift, which is, you know, right now I'm actually getting to do, getting ready to do a bodybuilding show and it's at the end of August. So cool. Yeah. And it, that was just, it kind of came out of nowhere. A friend suggested it to me. So I was like, all right, here we go. Let's, let's give it a shot because. You ever done you, one before? No, never even been to one. But as you know, that extra pressure, right? That extra pressure. Yeah, deadline. Extra pressure makes a huge difference. Like you said, you took up yoga recently, right? Yeah. And for you to talk about it for a while is one thing. But then for you to actually, a friend or, or a girlfriend or wh whoever it might be, says, hey, you're going to yoga with me today. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And you go and you do it. That extra pressure to actually get you to do it makes a big difference. But, you know, in the household, the bodybuilding diet has been different <laughs> because it's so restrictive. I can't even eat out because I don't really know what they're going to put in the food. Right. You know, on a keto diet, you know, they throw some oils in there. The oils may not be the healthiest thing or whatever it is that they're cooking with, but you don't really care. You're like, eh, it's just extra fat. It's not a huge deal. The fat is part of the diet. When you do a bodybuilding style diet, fat is uh, not your main source of fuel. Carbohydrates are your main source of fuel and you eat a shit ton of protein. It's, it's weird because it's, uh, you know, a lot of people look at it and say, oh, it's, bro, you know, it's bro science. Right. It is, it can be considered bro science, but it's stuff that has just worked. Right. For it's got whom. function to it for decades. So yeah, there's a reason there's why some efficacy. To Look, it. there's some, uh, old school things that, uh, collegiate wrestlers do that people are like, that's stupid. Why are they still doing that? Hey, it's cause it works. Right. Or even fighters like, man, they train four times a day. That's a little much. Well, the guy's the UFC champion, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. what do we do? Yeah, there's a guy I just saw. The message boards are crazy. I never knew how mean people were until I, I until message. I think people got meaner with message boards, maybe. But Hell, yeah. God, you see, you see, like, people, the nicest people in the world, and you're like, can't believe that guy just said that about that guy. Like, that, that guy doesn't show up like that anywhere in life, and somebody's like, here's the worst thing I could think of about you that might be true. I just saw somebody like Francis Naganu that just lost. Oh, yeah. And they're like, go back to the drawing board, punk, and all that. And I'm like, it's one of the most dangerous, frightening dudes in the world. And go back to the drawing. That's what, like what we got yeah, for people is like right. no support. Just That was a crazy fight. And, it I, and it seemed like with Lewis, it seemed like his back. I feel like he had him. hip or back problems. And I he heard couldn't. him saying something in the corner, and that it it was great. His corner man was like, "Dude, I don't give a fuck about your back." He's like, "You're right. in a fight right now. You need to." Wake and he up. did. He's out there whipping kicks. He's. I mean, he was, he, he was trying, he and he put knew all his he was whole in, effort in. He knew he was in a lot of pain, and I could see that the shadows, that the ghosts of uh, the guy whose last fight were all on him. You could just see how he moved, and you're like, "Oh, he got. He's shook, and he's reticent, and he doesn't want to risk." Even, you know that there's that point where he doesn't even want to risk to punch because he's afraid that's an opening that could be that like and you could just see it and he he made a post to that uh, yeah. effect later and you just got to walk through it and live in that stuff well, and then you know, go okay I'm going to adjust now it's a good uh, analogy to all the people that are watching all the people that are like overly commenting on it. obviously the fighters can say whatever they want because they're in there they sure. do it they understand it they understand the hurdles they understand the risk. And so if, if another fighter's like, hey, man, I thought he was being a coward, that's kind of one thing. But the people that are watching, they, they have not even their own life, have not even taken risks. They right. have not even thrown punches back. When other people have said mean things to them, other people have kept them down, other people have held them back their whole life. They never stood up for themselves for one thing. But the second they get a chance to criticize, yeah. and they're the first people to recognize it too, right? Oh my God! Look at him. He's being such a bitch. Yeah, I know that. I know that guy in myself. And it's like, well, yeah. There's a reflection right, you know, right. from the TV. It's like show when you it. try to have a standard anywhere, right? Try to change anything in your diet, and the people closest to you are going to be like, "Come on, just this one time. Try to quit drinking. See what happens to all your friends." Yeah. Oh, one won't hurt you. You know, there's all that stuff that. that oh, people you're are being dying. a big pussy now. What are you doing? They don't want that <laughs> reflection. They're like, "Ooh, does that? Does him having a standard mean my standard's low?" And then. Maybe I don't like that, so maybe I'm going to beat him up for wanting to have a higher standard. And go, who do you think you are, dude? You high, you know? Yeah, sorry, and I don't all do that, that anymore. I don't, I don't cuss anymore either, or whatever. Right, right? and then they're like, oh, <laughs> right. Does that, am I going to burn? <laughs> they got to really keep everything. Uh, what What was your emotional stuff like with the food? Like you go up to three three hundred pounds yeah. or whatever, and like, because um, one of the things that I got in like ketosis was interesting to me because it leveled up my emotional ups and downs. Yep. I just, you know, I felt like the depressions that I would get into, 
they wouldn't be so deep and so long. And it was a more tenable path for me. It seemed like, you know, I would say that I, I, you know, at some point I lost control of the diet, but I never really lost control of myself. I, I've never really been, uh, someone that has been like, had a lot of emotion, Buffing emotional, around by emotional that, yeah. swings. Uh, however I would, yeah, definitely like kind of comfort eat, you know, you feel the stress of the day or the stress of, uh, whatever's weighing on your mind and, and, uh, and you want to eat. My whole thing was like, I just wanted to be as big and as strong as possible, <laughs> but I just got carried away with it. Cause I didn't have to eat the way that I was eating. And I, I think, I, I think I'd be lying to myself if, if I say, I said, I didn't know better even then. Like I, I knew, but I knew that there would be a, I knew I could have done it with rice. You're like there's a price to pay and, and potatoes. And I knew that I could have done it at a slower rate, but, I wanted to do it with peanut butter cups <laughs> and ice cream and stuff like that, you know? So I, I mean, I would still, I ate, I ate good. I would say about 70% of the time, you know, but it should have been more like 80 or 90. Right. Cause if you really think about it, when you're really trying to be, when you're not trying to be good at something, when you're trying to be great at something, it takes that much more effort. Yeah. You got to really be laser Better focused pay in the details. And you know, you know this with uh, with fighters and some of your friends and some of your friends that want to be actors and different things like that. It's great to attack every day with everything that you got, but if you're only sleeping four hours a day, that's not really right. a good strategy. Yeah. After a while, you're like, well, dude, that's not you know, or drinking, or it's, not, it's just not sustainable. It doesn't make any sense. You're like, well, the, how are you going to get after your goal? Because you have to be in this for the long haul. Mm-hmm. How you know I I've, I've been watching you for for years you know in in all these different movies that pop up and we've been friends for a long time now. How do we prevent Tate Fletcher from dying? I mean, you die all the time in just yeah. about everything. I mean, you got gonna s- again shortly. I know you're a big strong guy. You got good defense. You think I'd be able to last? <laughs> you're not. Or I'm, I'm kind of immortal. I mean, I think in that way too. You know, is that's the one thing is they keep really trying, but here I stand. Oh, and you just keep, <laughs> you keep, you keep, you keep a real life zombie. What, uh, what are some movies that you have, uh, that, that are more recent that, that you've been doing, that you've been working on? Uh, recently coming up, man, it, the, it, when it rains, it pours kind of, I got four different offers for shows after I just got a job on, on a show for the next month, you know, um, God, what's coming out right now? The, the and, uh, last couple NCIS has been been on in a couple little television shows and looking for some stuff coming up that'll be exciting this uh, this fall. Uh, you know, Jurassic World. We just Keith and I were in the first one, and then uh, the the second one that just came out. Um, Lacey, our third partner in Caveman, she trains Bryce Howard, and so mm-hmm. Bryce is familiar with our brand and all that. And then she says, "Hey, the first time I walked in, I'm uh, I got Starbucks, and I'm kind of this corporate." dogged real rigid woman that doesn't have many friends and i come in with my own starbucks and so this time we're going in and we wanted to use like a smaller craft coffee and we thought caveman would be perfect and so they come in and they've got that she distributes caveman to all her friends after she's woke kind of in the second yeah uh showing of it which is which was cool you know and and it's just uh for me as far as the films go i've been practice i've been just in uh practicums lately a lot of classes and just getting into the art of that a little bit, gotten up on stage a couple of times for stand up, and, and just trying, like, I, I just, what uh, was that I, like? if I'm not working, that I try to push the, the, the edges of my comfort. Yeah. And it, it is, it is, it's one of the things that I've admired the most is stand up comedians is especially the beginners. I mean, and then to see guys like to watch Rogan is like, oh you know, God. it doesn't dawn on me. I get muted a lot. Cause we, we've lived together. We traveled together a lot. Like I see I'm, I'm immersed in that. And it's hard to be an awe and wonder if you're around somebody a lot, but fuck man, I watch him perform and I go, man, like I like, I'm like my friend. I just remember seeing him at the ice house and I was like, my friend's a genius. Like he's a, he's a, re- oh, that's a yeah. real genius that's right. happening. And, and you look at the comics that have made a difference, the George Carlin's and the priors and, yep. and all that, that have really uh, pushed society in different ways that have broken the rigidity off of it and kind of brought people together more. And I think that it's a, it's one of the most useful art forms as far as, forming a healthy society that there is because there's nothing taboo and the things that are taboo, they grow into cancers for us either on, on the, the micro metric of our own bodies or the macro yeah. of the whole society. And, and they expose those dark corners, which 
I'm super appreciative of. And the ones that do it really well, you watch Chappelle do it. Those guys can talk about anything and it's not offensive. It's thought provoking. Really, yeah. Even you know? these, even in these, uh, even delicate in these times. times and even, uh, you know, watching, uh, someone like, <laughs> someone like Joey Diaz who just, I mean, he just destroys you. He's with a joke. juggernaut. Holy crap, man. He just destroys you with jokes. And when I went to go see him and, and Rogan with Joey Diaz, I couldn't, I couldn't breathe when I was watching him. He's making me, he's making me laugh so much. And the funny thing is, is like, it's all very borderline. You're like, should I even be laughing about this? But it makes you laugh harder. It reminds me when you're a kid. Right. Here's some, you know, one of your friends used the F word or whatever. Yep. And you're laughing about it. Yeah, you're laughing about something so silly and random, and you kind of know that you shouldn't be uh, even sharing that, and you shouldn't right. be talking about any of that. He, not even sure what those words mean. He goes down that uh, rabbit he hole does. hard, and I never thought about it the way that you said how they're kind of they're breaking a lot of barriers down. Dude. Religious, racist. Who who got who got stuff. racists laughing about how stupid it is the way that black people are treated more than Richard Pryor? Right. Like, that's a dude that, I mean, he used that position in a way that was so fucking artful that even idiots that are racist pigs are go, are giggling right. about it until it can dawn on them, like, this is ridiculous that I have these views. That's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it's right. like the, they don't even get the joke until later, I think. It's <laughs> it's an ama- the layering that can happen. Ne- you ever watch Neil Brennan? No. Dude, he's got a thing called I Three Mics that's out. Cha- changes i mean the whole face of stand-up comedy changed for me with that and you look he goes into a deep you would love it because he goes into a deep uh exposure of his emotional maladies of depression and things like that and ways that he looked through that and it, he was a dude that he he co-wrote he co-created the Chappelle show with dave mm-hmm. and so he's uh one of his day one dudes and man it's it's phenomenal but yeah to watch what people can do with art man it's it's been uh Great to behold, man. How did you get into acting in the first place? Um, I was working at a nightclub. All my stories start like that. I was working at this nightclub, and this guy came in, and he goes, we need uh, some big white boys for this film we're doing out at the old prison. I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and it was Master P and all his guys that were at my door. Wow. So me and a few friends went out and, and tried, and that was where I first got into it, and then I never did anything again for I did a couple of commercials, but I didn't do anything so for years after that. Was that uh, 2000? Kind of regular acting, or is that? It was more? an acting job. Okay. But it was real low budget as a Master P film, I see, you know? I see. And so uh, Master P made up for quality by quantity. And he just he pushed out, I don't know, five movies a year for a mm-hmm. few years and, and was really putting all that out. And so I had this acting role that, uh, you know, all the contracts were funny. And then I did a fall off a of three story tier prison like like where i died or maybe i got put in the infirmary forever but that was the first mm-hmm. start of it yeah i died from the beginning now that i think about it but then my friend keith willard was the he was a stunt coordinator never met him before and he goes hey dude come on out to my i got a spare uh, bedroom in my back house and come out to la and stay there and this was back in santa fe new mexico and i was like that just seems so unrealistic to me that i'm gonna go and be in movies man but thanks a lot i got this one job working the door at this nightclub and uh I, i've got this amateur uh wrestling stuff that i'm doing i really like that and so see you later and then i never really looked at it again i had this whole other career that happened and then around 2009 darren prescott walked into my gym he was just looking for a place to work out and train while he was working on a movie called paul and after i don't know we roll for 10 15 days and then he goes oh i heard that you got a sad card and i go oh yeah yeah and he goes hey man you want to do something in this movie and how'd you get this and that turns out he and keith are really tight buddies the guy that I'd met 10 years ago on the show. And uh, my world's kind of- Keith Jardine, right? Uh, no, Keith Willard, the, the original oh, okay. stunt coordinator on the Master P flick. And so uh, got pulled in there and then got onto Red Dawn. And then after Red Dawn, I was like, man, I might this might really be something that I could do. And so I, I kind of started following that vein. You know, I was through fighting at the time. I was just doing bodyguard work, which, I, you know, paid well, but I wasn't super excited about, you know, and- uh, and so that that became the next thing, and I started hustling after Did you that. Kind of learn learn how to act uh, on, afterwards. On, I got like on the job. Almost. I got suggested to. You yeah. know, I wish I would have gone to Juilliard or done some kind of. Um, proper schooling in as that you way. were doing it did you think that you needed uh to to go to school for it, or did no. you think like oh, i'm pr- i'm pretty i'm pretty natural at this uh nothing feels natural it always feels like a fight when they go ready and action that feels like 
Are you ready? Are you ready? And fight. It feels like that because it feels like now it's yours to lose. You're a green guy here, and if you fuck this up, you're going to – and so do you want to be the guy that the failure was hinged on? Or You know what I mean? And so I was like – I just always, I crave, you know, whatever I get asked to do, I crave to do a good job at that thing. And so I didn't want to have a guy ask me to do something. And then I know he has a boss. And then I make this guy look like shit for choosing. I'm like, fuck no, man. I need the best guy to be in that job. And if it's not me, I'd rather have somebody else do it. And, and so then I, my whole next course was how do I endeavor to become, you know, the, the guy that's the best guy to do the job. And so that's, that's what I set out to do since then and what they'd said because in the stunt world there's like nd stunts they call it like which is nondescript stunts where you know you're in a we're all on a swat team and we all have hoods on we can go in but then later you're also the guy that's the florist that takes a bullet when the robber comes in and then also you're the robber that's up on top of the roof and that falls off you can be all these different guys and nobody sees that that's the same fella right Unless you're six foot four, 240 pounds, and then you go, that guy looks different than the other guys. And especially <laughs> if there's something without a mask on, it's like I'm very distinctive looking. And so everybody said, you're never going to double a guy. There's only like two guys that you can double. And because uh, you're not, you know, 5'10 and 170 pounds, there's right. a, like a, and so you're going to be a character. So you, it, you're going to need to be good at performing, at acting, at not, not just physical performance, but all of it. So then I started just taking classes and getting coaching towards that, just like I would as a, as a BJJ athlete or an MMA athlete, something like that. Have you done some theater stuff too? I have, and that was terrifying. That's it is terrifying. Be- That's what I'm in right now. Oh, okay. And it's scary. <laughs> it's like when you said like, oh, what do you like? I did, my whole life is typified by do the next scary thing in front of you. The easy shit is of no consequence. That's common, and I'm not looking to be a common dude, you know? And so, and, and Keith had always had that kind of, Jardine, that mind frame for fights and everything else. He's like, yeah, it's fucking, it's easy. If you're already down and a dude's smashing you with elbows, man, the ref's going to stop this in a moment, and that's an easy way to go. Or you can fight to your elbow, and you can push up, and, you, and that's the right way to go, you know? And you're going to take a couple shots, but you're going to live, and... And that's the thing is like, I'm going to walk into the jaws of death kind of thing is the idea. And those things can look different. I mean, that could be being on stage. That can be learning knitting. That could be fucking going into learning how to surf or whatever. And so that, that was the thing for me with this acting class. And I, I go in and it was different than one-on-one coaching, different even than a class in that there's eight or 10 of us and there's a stage and it's a little fucking stage in front of us. I mean, it's maybe twice as big as this room maybe three times, but it's like, that's not there's, and there's, and it's just light. There's nowhere to hide. And so (laughs) I'm looking at it. And so it's the second, the first class they go, Hey, we need a monologue for you to do. And I go, okay, cool. And he goes, do you have one? I go, no. And he says, okay, I'll assign one. So he signs me a monologue from this musical. And, uh, it's a character, Sam Bick out of a play called assassins by Sam Shepard. That was about guys that tried to kill the president or girls, squeaky froms in the play, all that. So I do this one monologue and so we prepare it for the next week. I go in and, and there's like, like I said, like eight other guys. There's a guy that, that looks like Odin or something, this older fellow that's there. And, and I go, oh, shit, am I going to go first? Or do I go, like, when do I go? And uh, maybe I get it done with. I go first because I'm nervous as fuck by the time. I don't really have it all memorized 100%. It's 15 minutes of dialogue for wow. me. And, and it's like, so it's a big undertaking. Oh, fuck. And then uh, right when I'm debating about shooting my hand up first, this guy, John, in front of me, the older guy, he does, boom. And he goes up, and he's played this part that he presents, which he does beautifully. He's been paid for it twice in full theater productions. And I was like, oh, he is really good, and I'm not like that. And then the next person goes, and I think, well, we'll see. And then they're really good. Everybody, and I go, well, I'll just go last, and maybe they'll run out of time. I, my mind is always looking for a way out, man. Like, I, I got this critic inside me yeah. that I've been trying to quell since I'm little for a long time. And then they go up, and I'm like, I'm for sure in the wrong class. These guys are all excellent. Like, I don't know what to do here. And then I was like, I'm looking. I'm like, maybe I could fake an injury on the way down. Like, I'll just trip over the step or something. And I was like, and I'm watching my mind, and I'm going, you are fucking insane. What is wrong with you? You're the only guy that will sign up for all the goods and then be like, I don't want any of the goods, though. I don't want to participate. It's like, <laughs> it's like you're retarded a little bit. <laughs> and then I go and, the, and, and I just, you know, you walk through that and, and do it. And then I did it again and again. 
And when I left that day, I was like a different guy. And that's the thing of walking through stuff like that. I just learned years ago that you walk through that stuff that feels that way. That's exactly the stuff you need to be doing. All the shit that your brain is fucking locking into going, nah, let's avoid this. Let's go that way. That's going to, you're going to look bad if you do that. And so it's like, what face do you want to sell? You want to save your ass or your face. You can't do both, you know? And so you got to put yourself in this position to dig in the deep spots that are for everybody, you know, for some people, that's not a fear, uh, fearful kind of endeavor. For me, I was like, I'm going to be on that whole stage by myself and they're all going to be looking at me. Like, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. I want to disappear, you know, yeah. like, and so that whole thing, I think that those are the things that, um, keep me alive. And those are the next things that I look to do. I'm always looking to enlarge, uh, my capacity for discomfort and the more discomfort that I go, Oh, now this discomfort is just my living room. I get to live in that place, man. And other people then, I mean, in a competition world, if they're uncomfortable where I'm comfortable, fucking I've already won. And, and so that became kind of the deal for me is how do I find that authenticity and comfort in places that are despicable to sit in where I can just find my breath in and it's all right. The things you uh, can't do are oftentimes the things that you should be doing. Right. Well, like you were talking about right. downstairs, you want the heaviest deadlift possible. Mm -hmm. Awesome. But if you don't work on these other things, you're not going to grow. You know, if you work on these other things right. that don't seem connected, everything will enhance. And if you only work on the thing that you're good at, it's only going to get better a little bit. And so you're going to be mediocre. Right. You're only going to be able to drive that up so much. You got to be really open minded. What has it been like to be on the set? I mean, you've been on the set with some, you know, bangers, some, some of the yeah, some of the yeah. best people in the world. I mean. What's it like to see uh, a Denzel Washington act? I mean, you're in a full-on fight scene with him. Yeah. A great fight scene, by the way. Really great. <laughs> it was yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, big props. I like was super pumped when I when I saw that movie, and I saw you guys going back and forth, because I was like, oh, he's going to square off against Denzel, and then that's going to be it. Yeah. And you guys actually went at it. It was pretty yeah. cool. Really grateful. I mean, Keith Willard, again, he, he uh, coordinated that show, and Lynn Oding uh, put a lot into that fight. Like, there's... And, Steve-O, Steve-O Young, another dude, like a, a lot of people made that fight happen. And I was fortunate enough to be the guy. They're like, you're in the spot though. And it's got, it's got its challenges, but it was all, to me, it was all to the good. And the guy that doubled Denzel also is just maybe one of the best movers in the world. Just fantastic. So like, I, I get to work with these guys that are like, the, the real Captain America, like mm. the real super, like I get to right. work with these guys that are, I'm just humbled to be in the room with. So uh, that's always my endeavor is go, I want to make those guys proud that they're happy that I'm here in that way. And, and like what it was like with them is, uh, is like anything else. I go to be helpful mm. and I go, where can I be the most help here? And that's ears wide open, mouth shut and just paying attention, you know? And, uh, and there's a, there's a risk, you know, without, without the consequence, there is no real reward that matters. Right? right. So yeah, there's a risk that maybe D gets mad at me or that, or whatever. There's a thousand things that could happen. Um, but it was, it was a fantastic thing to be able to be a part of. And then, you know, all, all these, all these fights, like I, the, the first time I ever got nervous, I just quelled that because I took other spiritual lessons that I knew from other parts of my life and I just implemented them in, onto the work scene. Mm. And I remember being on Avengers and I'm looking at guys, I'm looking at like, um, like Tunaway Reed doubles the rock and, right. and uh, you know, you're looking at like guys that are heroes of yours that are there and they're in the circle. Heidi Moneymaker, you know, she is Black Widow and, and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, God, I'd love to be over there talking with those guys. And they're in a circle talking, they're old friends and I'm a new guy. And I'm, and I'm like, I wonder how I could, like, and I felt like a little kid, yeah. you know, like when you're a little kid and you switch schools and you're like, man, I wish those boys would talk to me. I'd like to play kickball too or whatever. Right. And then you're like, kind of shoes they got on maybe it's if I had better <laughs> shoes maybe and you're like fuck and then you go over there to find something all you know is that you're bullshit by the time you walk up i'm thinking what do they want me to be that i think that i could be for the you're in this fucking mind screw right and it ain't about the shoes and all they know is you look you're acting funny you yeah. know and then i've done the thing that yeah, is said, working hey, against play me some kickball they'd be right. like sure so the same thing, I go up to these guys then, and I'm like, hey, you guys need anything from craft services? Can I get you some water? And like, just go to be helpful. And so everywhere in my life where I look and I get uncomfortable, I get questioning, I go, where can I be helpful? And then that's always the right answer, you know? Do the hard thing and always be helpful. Who is uh, harder to beat up or harder to fight, The Rock? Or, beat up? Uh, <laughs> Who did I beat up on film? <laughs> Who was harder um, to fight, The Rock or uh, Denzel? Uh, Denzel, we, we filmed that, I think over three days, mm. you know, with the prep and everything right. that went in and, and 
uh, with, with Dwayne, it was, it was easy. We had great riggers, great guys that set it up. Um, you know, and which is a lot of my friends, you know, you feel like you have a huge support team there and everybody's helping each other. And I'm just the cog in the wheel that is in this spot through right. that. And the thing is, is, as everybody asks about how those guys are, or, you know, you get stories, Hollywood stories about what this guy's character's like right. and all that. And I, I just, two things. I don't know what it's like to have that. Like, I don't know what it's like to not be able to go to Whole Foods. Right. Like, it's got to be a tremendous adjustment for yeah, people yeah and then also everybody having a hand like tugging your sleeve and i don't know man yeah, like, everybody wants in my own little ways it seems hard let alone to be on that kind of a yeah a pedestal and those guys are are by and large always the bigger the star the more uh, they're more gracious and more kind and generous and thoughtful than almost anybody else that i've met in the world like i, I see i worked on a little tiny nothing show with brian cranston um called get a job one day I'm there. We I, we just I don't we didn't even high five. I don't think might have said hello. And then two years later, I I'm on Breaking Bad, and the first day that I see Mr. Cranston comes. Hey Tate, how are you doing? And he welcomes me to set. Like I'm I'm not anything in that. Right, right. And fucking he goes, dude. The thing we did in Sherman Oaks, man. That I hope that thing comes out. And he's remembering, and I'm like, this is that's crazy to me. And the same thing happened with Hemsworth. And I worked with him on Red Dawn. Yeah. Met him one time in passing, and then three years, it was two or three years later that I'm on Thor and doing a safety thing, and I'm just getting coffee. He just sees me from the back. Hey Tate, I'm like, like I want, I don't know that I would be able to pick him out that easily. And it's right. like, and and of course he probably looks at the call sheet. He and he's. Right. He's paying but, attention, yeah. But that's awareness. That's caring. That's a that's a character that he's developed. He's like, this is part of this matters. And I and I remember the first time I ever met a guy, um, I was looking for some help and I and I go in and I'm talking to this group of guys and they met every Monday. Then I went back the next Monday and a dude that I'd met the previous Monday goes, Hey Tate, how are you doing, man? And I was like, How the f and I thought, what a fucking gift, man, just remembering my name. Yeah was was everything and like you know i think that's the way like ram das has this you know, thing about right, we're all just yeah. walking each other home you know right. and to the degree that that we all curate each other's wellness and kindness is like it's a huge benefit and it seems to be where the universe operates at the highest degree you know the best results yeah you think about like when is there anybody ever given you any sort of money that made you feel as good as that guy saying hey tate what's up right. yeah the guy that you barely know yeah, it just doesn't Isn't happen. Isn't that crazy? It just doesn't happen. Like the best things in life, they really are free. Right. Somebody giving you a compliment, somebody picking you up when you need it, somebody remembering your name, uh, somebody sending you a text. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, I saw you got hurt on the set today. Like, how, how's your knee or yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. It's, cra it's, like, it's crazy. It's crazy. Like, it, what, that guy's thinking, that's fucking cool. Like, it's oh, so I'm beneficial. Right, you know? yeah, and, and, and for you, this guy told me one time, he goes, he goes leave everybody with a gift. And I, I go, okay. He goes, even people you walk by on the street, think, give them a gift in your mind. And watch, you know, this the whole thing about being the watcher of your mind. It's like it becomes a whole nother exercise that you can do where it's like I can see somebody I really like a lot, and I, and but maybe they're a little extra in certain ways, and I'm like, oh, fuck, this guy walking up, right? But also, hey, what's up, bro? How you doing? Happy to see him too in that way. And I'm yeah. like, that first part of the conversation, does that need to be there? Is it helpful to me? Is it hurting me? Like, those are fucking important questions to ask. And so, like, the way I, my mom always used to say, you know, you tarnish your soul when you swear, Tate. You're only hurting yourself. I'll, like, whatever. And it Fuck wasn't that. until years <laughs> later that I go, there's real truth in those yeah. lessons. It's kind of like I don't, I don't find yoga. I don't find any other kind of thing except for the thing I'm doing because jujitsu is the best and fuck you is kind of, you know, it's like when you fall in love with something, yeah, you're I like, fight, this yeah. is the flag I'm carrying. But until you're broken up and you go, oh, no, this yoga is really restorative and curative for me and I need this. Or, you know, your mind gets open. You know, right. the universe will allow your mind to get open. It'll hurt you. A little, it'll, it'll give you little nudges here and there. And, and they get more and more fierce. The nudges do as you ignore the, the signs that you should be taking care of some things. You ever just. I mean, sometimes you walk around and you're like, I'm just making a fucking grumpy face all day. Like, I got a resting <laughs> bitch face. Right. And sometimes you notice, like I notice it a lot, especially like going through the airport, you yeah. know, that so, that so many people try are to just, smile at everybody. They're just wear they're just wearing it. And I try too. Yeah. but every once in a while, you kind of realize that the day's wearing on you too. And you got that, 
that uh, you know, mad dog and everybody. Right? I know. And you're just like, what, what am I doing? And but, we're big guys. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't help. Well, so I get people, they'll, they'll come up and they'll say, man, I was going to say hi, but I saw you in the gym and like, I was terrified. And I'm like, I don't think I'm intimidating. But right. then I'm like, well, yeah, I'm probably acting like a dick. Right. You know, it was, and you got veins coming out of your whole body. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm lifting or, or whatever it might be. But even just walking through Gold's Gym, where, where most of the people are pretty positive, but I, I see a lot of the guys and girls there, they got their head down and they're kind of focused in on what they're doing. A lot of times I'm walking through and I'm pretty, I feel pretty happy. And I'm like, man, I, I wish, I wish more people would feel the way that I feel inside, but maybe they, maybe they are feeling that way, but maybe they're just in a certain mode right. for that particular yeah. day, you know? Yeah. I like it when somebody can shake me out of it and go, like, I walk in and I see your face and I'm like, oh, your face is broken, Tate. You better, like, <laughs> better chip up. You know what I mean? And it's like, right. I, I, yeah, that, that whole thing of being conscious about I like how what I'm you presenting. said too about, uh, oh shit, here comes this person again. I, right. I, I use that analogy often. Oh yeah. Cause you don't want to be that person. No. Yeah, like you're kind of like a burden on everybody. Oh man, is right. conversation's gonna get negative. This is gonna kind of suck. like I gotta be with this guy for three hours or whatever. You're like, oh man, right? Well, that's just, the thing about it just drags everything down. You're like, that's Fuck. the thing about being on set too. Like unless you're, oh yeah, I can imagine. If you're, you better. You're like one of the highest. If you're a twat to be around, <laughs> you're one of the highest paid people there because nobody will put up with like. You got to be with these people 16 hours a day. Everybody's pretty cool. Like there's not a lot of twats walking around. Like everybody's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Because it's it necess- it, like it's a society that necessitates that. Like you're a traveling circus basically. You know, we'll pull up stakes and go anywhere and make a fucking movie. It doesn't matter mm. what state or country or anywhere that we're in. Um and that being the case, the only kind of tonifying thing is that everybody's cool cuz we all got to get along for this common purpose. Right. You do a lot of stunts in the movies and stuff. How yep. do you protect yourself? How do you keep your body healthy? Um, I've gotten more and more into the longevity of my body in the last 10 years than I ever had been previously because I always figured I'd expire before I wore out the parts. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then here I am alive, much to my chagrin some days. <laughs> and uh, so how to then curate myself into longevity is kind of the thing that I started formaldehyde <laughs> well, <laughs> preserve you. you know? I, I remember a friend of mine, he was, uh, they would embalm people. His dad was, a uh, whatever yeah, they call that undertaker. That, undertaker. Yeah. And he, uh, got ditch weed once from Indiana or somewhere around that, that whole Michigan area at no THC in that weed. <laughs> and so he'd soak it in formaldehyde. And he called it the love boat. And you would you would get high off it almost <laughs> like PCP a little bit. Um, anyway, that's not How for kids so much. much. I, I so just much? heard I read a story. Oh, okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, to take care of myself, I go. It's the same thing, you know. You, I've gotten to see a lot of lessons. I've gotten to see guys that they get a little ding, and then they go, "Hey, man, get some oxys." That's the old. That's the eighties way, right? Mm-hmm. The guys would do that and curate pain, and then they end up junkies. And they and and yeah. uh, there's a lot of dark roads that happen. And people and, die. And for me, I've just, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been sober for like 24 years now because wow. I, I've tried that road awesome. for a long time, you know? Yeah. And, and so I go, okay. So I've had three surgeries since then. And the way I've dealt with pain was, uh, extra strength Tylenol and ice. Cause I just, I, I would think about it and I go, well, it's not curing me. These, these, uh, narcotics, they just distract me. Mm-hmm. They make my endorphins high enough that they're bigger than my pain receptors are giving me messages. And, and I thought, so that's not helpful and, and it's probably damaging and ice just takes it away and can take the whole problem away if I numb it out. And so I would just do that. And I, I just got more disciplined in myself in that way. And so then what do I do to stay away from the surgeries? Cause I'm really against getting cut open. Um, is I just start, like I started yoga. I start what, like, why do any of us work out? I would hang out with this dude, Harrison. Harrison's 93. Harrison is begging to be done. He's, he's done. He's tired, you know? But it wasn't until, like, last year that he got tired. I only met him last year. And I go, hey, when's the, you know, he's in World War II, blown up on the shores of Italy. He's uh, smuggled hash through Syria, been arrested, put in a Syrian prison, uh, accidentally killed a guy running, like, uh, um, running over him. Been, at, like, yeah. was a professor at NYU. He got, uh, after the war with Germany, he went to, I think, Brown University, and he ended up uh, with a, like a PhD in German studies. And, and, and I said, why'd you do that? He said, I wanted to find out more about these people that had gone to war with the world. 
And unless I could read their history and their tongue, I didn't think I'd be able. Like, so he's, he's a trip, man, this guy. And I go, hey, you know that thing when guys are like, hey, uh, well, when I was younger, I used to do that. Like, and when I was fighting, I'd meet guys that were 25 years old. Mm. And they'd be like, oh, when I was younger, I used to do that, but I got this knee from high school. And you fucking pussy. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like they're cowards everywhere just dying to <clears throat> fucking retire at 18. Like, like bitches. And uh, I go, when's the first time you got like that feeling like, oh, well, when I was younger, like when you started making excuses for your behavior because of your maladies or whatever, he goes, I never felt diminished until this latest debacle. And he's fucking 92 years yeah. old. He can't piss anymore. He's got to wear a catheter for the rest of his days. And it's not until then that he ever felt like, oh, fuck, I'm not really quite up to speed anymore. And I thought, man, that's just a positive mindset to carry your mind in, you know? Like, I need that. Yeah, what so a tough bastard. I take him to work out. And we do, these, we do a bunch of different workouts. It's not whatever. But they're foundational movements. And I find that when I'm able to take him step by step in four motions to go from a lying position to a standing position, that his speech improves, that his gait improves, that his proprioception, he's more aware, he's grounded, like it's a trip. And so little bits go a long way. Well, he's also a fall risk whenever he goes to the hospital. He's never fallen, but they're just scared about these things. And so they don't let him get up. They'll keep him in bed. They'll keep him in a wheelchair. They'll keep all that shit. So they're robbing him of motion. And what I think about the same reason you work out or I work out or Harrison works out is all the same. John Jones works out, whatever athlete, anybody works. It's all the same reason. It's to continue doing the things that we enjoy doing in daily life for in perpetuity, right? So the thing that we want to do today, that's what we're working out for. And him is just getting up and down off the ground or the toilet or whatever and be able to move around without pain. And so for me, like uh, my workouts change to do that. After I stopped fighting and I would go into film, you know, my thing becomes uh, more longevity based, you know, and more how do I stay ready and prepared in, uh, in that kind of way all throughout the day rather than a big amp up, warm up, uh, endeavor to do the thing and then a uh, culmination of that. And so I've just been trying to do little things all day long and, and just keep in motion. And right now I'm just looking into... Uh, you know, like what we were talking about downstairs of mixing in like some bodybuilding stuff with strongman stuff. Right now, what I do is I do heavy strongman movements a couple of times a week, and then I'll do. Uh, Those are fun, aren't they, dude? It's fuck, it's the best, and it's short and it's hard. You go, I mean, where you do you start, usually train at? At Deuce, at Deuce oh, yeah. Gym, right, yeah. right on Lincoln. Um, yeah, you gave a seminar there a couple yep. years back. Uh, so my friend Logan Gelbridge has started this magical place down there. That's just. You know, it's uh, he's the holder of the vibe there. Like, it's really, a, it's a dope spot in Venice. And so I go down there and like, you know, when you start accessing weight, that's your body weight that you're like, we're going to carry this across this odd object. And you go from zero to a hundred of intensity really quickly. Yeah. And so you're only keeping that up 60 seconds or something like right. that. And, and that's great. But I find out that I start to wear down and I can't recover the way I did. And so right. doing bodybuilding exercise really helps my recovery because this blood volumization that I experience, I think is super curative. And so then I do that and then I layer that on yoga and I feel fucking better than I've, I mean, I, I wish I were doing all the things that I was doing now to take care of my body when I was using my body in a different way for my, my livelihood. Not that right. I'm not now, but like at those kinds of consequential stakes where it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, However, it's where we are, you know, and so that's that's what I do lately. When you know you were years years ago, you mentioned you were messing with some drugs that were you know really messing with your sure. lifestyle and stuff. Have you found anything like? Because I know you asked me some questions about kratom a while back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, have you found anything recently that's uh, uh, that that you feel is is, is helpful? Uh, that's not. Uh, you know, that, that's not necessarily uh, as uh, Down that road. as negative as a painkiller. Well, what I found is I found, I, I got turned on to it through a friend of mine who I met through Joe uh, Gino. He owns a company called Speedweed. And so Speedweed is a, it's a marijuana delivery system, uh, not into the body, but into your home or whatever. Like let, they'll deliver whatever to you. They have a menu and all that. Um, but Amazon he's, weed. He's, 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 he's given me, yeah, he's given me, uh, uh, turned me on to like CBD and taught me a lot cool. about the different terpenes and how these are associated with uh, depression or this is more associated with uh, nurturing your health back or the, like. 
And so I've been messing with CBDs a lot in the last year, and that's been super helpful to me. But also, like, the, the biggest number one thing is foundational movements and getting back into movement and uh, being intentional in my movements has been more helpful than almost everything. I, I'd, I'd look to create them for uh, pain. Like, everything that I looked, it just made me sick. I didn't get any relief from it, which um, I, was, I was really looking to. And uh, But I think my body is just not, that's not a, ally of mine in my body you know and and so people, maybe a good thing and people yeah who knows who knows yeah. yeah and people have talked about all these different things that and and i'll try stuff if it's inside of the structure of what i think is safe for myself but the number one thing is movement is like when i force myself and when i just face up to the bear and i go okay we're gonna have to fucking hold this pose for two minutes now in yoga i mean those are the battles that if you know, you, I can I can retreat retreat to comfort in that, right? Or I can get into the discomfort and the pain of it that that is going to be potent and and extreme for a short time that I get to choose. But if I don't go into that, I never get relief. If I stay in comfort, I never get relief. When I go into that and it's uncomfortable for these potent small sessions, I get huge relief for the rest of my life. I get openings. I get the space where the pain's not there because I think most of my pain is due to inflammation. And things like that and so yeah i i always tell people too like, you know what you do uh for yourself is always going to be more beneficial than uh, what you do to yourself you know to yourself would be uh, a pre-workout you know get hyped up for your workout right. but something for yourself would be to go on a 10 minute walk before you start your workout right in in the long run the 10 minute walk is going to be more productive it's going to be uh something that's going to get your body ready even just i mean there's little things you can do in the morning you could have uh, some water with some salt uh you can get out in the sun you know you get some of the sun rays your body starts to kind of learn okay now it's time to be awake and you listen to some good music on your way to the gym that could be your pre-workout but i think everyone's always kind of looking like it's got to be I'm looking for a pill. It's got to be this way or that way. And I'm totally guilty of it too. I got hundreds of supplements that I take yeah. all the time. Cause yeah, I'm always trying tried to everything. Co cover all my, cover all my bases. You know, the number one thing I've been turned on by a lot lately, and I'd love to hear your opinions on it is creatine. And it's the one thing I was just talking with uh, Kyle Kingsbury about it. And, and he was like, it's a, it's a nootropic to my understanding in a way, because of the way that it, it benefits ATP yeah. and all these kinds of things. And I started I, I thought, yeah, what, like, of course it is in that way. And so I, tra I take creatine every day. I take fish oil every day for the joints. And then really it's like, it's like what you and Chris talk about so much. I try, to, I try to eat my way into right health as opposed to trying to do these other things to cover up for my poor behavior, which was all mm -hmm. my past. was yeah. like, you know, people yeah. that go and beat themselves up at the gym. Oh, well, I've got to pay the price for the weekend that I had or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think, how broken is your fucking life? that your weekend is where you degrade yourself to the point right. where you have to pay penance the rest of the week. Right. Well, and that's, and that's where, and that's where supplements can be used kind of uh, in the wrong way. You know, somebody could think, Oh, I need all these antioxidants. It's like, well, you, if you just, if you eat properly and you're taking care of yourself, you don't need a lot of extra stuff. You just need the stuff that you need. And if you're eating a good diet and good diet could be so many different things for so many different people. But if you're not, extremely overweight and you're not abusing yourself you're not uh taking in drugs or alcohol and things are probably pretty good you probably don't need uh four thousand milligrams of vitamin c every day i mean look at dr baker some of the stuff that he's doing with the carnivore diet he's got hundreds and hundreds of people that are having more and more success with it all the time it doesn't mean that diet is uh for everybody it doesn't mean that everyone should only eat meat uh but what it does show you is that in the absence of eating things that are bad for you we don't even need excess vitamin C. We don't even need excess amounts of calcium. You're like, where do you even get the calcium from? Or where do I get, you know, this from or, or that from? It's like, well, actually, maybe you don't even need it. Have we ever even thought of that? Like the the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the list that they put out of your uh, recommended daily allowance of what you need, maybe that's just totally inaccurate because who's that a measure off of? Well, and also we see how compromise the fda and and government watchdog agencies are like that we we well, now even have, now google google's a piece of shit now you can barely even use it of course i mean we have it's really frustrating we have speaking of google we have these 
corporations ever since that we're we made corporations be shot after this people. Podcast, by the way, by some snipers. <laughs> I'm re- release me, please, Alexis. Um, like, like listening around or whatever. But the, you know, you look at you look at the, all that shit, and they don't. There's there's not a there's not this uh, there's not people looking out for us. There is none of that. And now we have corporations that are bigger than the GNP of most countries. It's like that is moving legislation. So you've got people that are complicit in you having cancer that are now calling the shots for health care also or whatever. You know, it behooves them that you're sick. And so <laughs> like in that kind of world, I mean, that's where like pirate life and this whole idea about caveman coffee and all that kind of came up was, let's, please quit begging for a fucking pill or just, dude, just tell me what to eat. It's like I need an educational system where you understand the components of just simple macronutrients, what you're doing and how they, how they affect your body. And without that, you're then a victim of listening to whoever has the loudest voice telling you what to do or has the right badge on. And, and those people are all complicit in your death. I mean, to a large degree, you can't trust that. And so this whole kind of educational awareness that's coming up, like, you know, like you guys doing the war on carbs and, and things like the ketogenic, when has that ever come up before? Like we're in this new space where it's like, no, no, these people are going, hey, this has function and performance for me because I was dying. So right. I, I, I'm not looking at it as like to get a test study at the university done or I don't give a shit about that. This saved my fucking life. Right. That's the only kind of stuff that I look at anymore, man. It's like, man, if it doesn't have legs that is, that's walking like, and it's an idea that came out of a laboratory, it's nice to have that to compound it or to give uh, warning signs or things to look out for. But for real efficacy, I need to see function and performance in your life. You know, and then I need to adopt it and go, well, maybe me too. And if I don't do this hundred percent, there's no chance that I'm going to be able to look at that and go, yeah, that worked for me too. Cause I'm going to have done it so muddily. So this whole thing about, um, a pill or whatever, it's like, fuck no, man, I, I I'd much rather teach the animal to have discipline, have consistency. And if you do certain things, you'll get certain results. And that's just the facts of it. But this whole thing where we're so compromised is just it's, it's weird. It's a weird time where we have the internet and that we have the most information ever, yeah. but we have the most questions about, is that true? Is that fake news? What's real? <laughs> yeah. We don't know. You know, it, it's uh, interesting with, with yourself, you know, being on a keto style diet and uh, living the life that you live now versus the life you lived before. What a lot of people see, you know, a lot of people that are heavy and that are, uh, enjoy foods that are fucking delicious donuts and these different things they think that their their life runs out, right? They think like, man, you're going to take those foods away. My life, that's going to mm-hmm. suck. How has it changed your life? Because I would imagine through the partying years and through some of those years, you probably have some cool stories. You probably have some stories where you were led down a really shitty path as well. But I would imagine your life's a lot better now. If my life were better the other way, I would be living that life, right? If my life were better with booze in it, I would for sure have booze in it. But for me, there's not one. Like, like when I look at stuff and it goes, is this going to enhance me financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically? Is it going to is it going to tip any of the metrics that that are my life that in a positive way? And it it comes up as no's on everything. I'm like, well, what's the point of that? You know, and and then what I find, you know, in in a lot of drug use, and it's like people can't curate their own emotions. They have an emotion, and they're like. I need a Zanny or, or whatever. And there's, there's, there's that. And that's like a trap. And it's, and it's for me, like, I don't give a fuck what it jump in front of a bus. I don't care. Like whatever you do, you do that's, I, mean, I understand everybody got to make their choices. I'm the fish I got to catch. And so I got to know for me, uh, in, in, in this biological mechanism, it just, it works contrary to my best interests, you know? And yeah, there's a critic inside me that, that, that craves different shit, but my job is is to hire my consciousness to the highest elevation possible so I can be the most used to my community as possible. And if I listen to that critic in there, he's working against those goals. So I just have to really watch my head more, I guess, with that. You know, and, and a lot of times, too, you think, uh, you know, was something really that hard? Like, is it really that hard to abstain from eating pizza? Is it really that hard? Once you work it out and once you work through it, and understand it better, and you feel how good these new foods can make you feel. You kind of forget about I do, some of those yeah. some of those cravings, and of course, those things will come back. And there's going to be times where you just need to enjoy it because the cravings end up being too great every once in a while. But I think a lot of times people are always just looking at 
okay, well, he said no carbs, so I can't eat these certain things. What I always try to tell people is you can eat, you can still eat those things. Those things are fine. You just got to eat them a lot less. So there's still room. There's still room for you to occasionally say, you know what? I am going to, on this particular day, I am going to hang out with my family. I am going to just, either, we're going to order pizza from our favorite pizza place, and I'm going to eat pizza with my kids, and we're going to laugh, and we're going to tell jokes, and we're going to just chill. Yeah. Why not, right? Yeah. Every Every once in a while, it's like, those things I do uh, it a couple times a year. Yeah, those things need those things need to happen. And you said a couple times a year, which is which is great because it shows how deep into it you are. But I even get I even get pleasure out of it uh, with masturbatory thought about it. Like I'll think about that fucking pizza and I'll think about what it looks like. Mm-hmm. I'll think about the smell of it and all that. And like I, I like that crust crispy and the crunch. And then I'll put that thought away, and it's not a big deal. The the and and I can get satisfied from that in a way, which is is demented maybe. Uh, but bit. <laughs> but uh, a lot of times that thought's more satisfying than the heaviness I feel after I eat it. I've learned that, and so I go, you know, what self am I presenting here to curate my the 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 little hungry fucking needy never is more is never enough like type of guy inside me, or somebody that wants to create a vessel that's larger than that and and my thing with the pizza with whatever there's only a couple i i i don't fuck with sugar uh except on real special locate like you know if i go with harrison we'll have dessert or whatever he'll have dessert every time but um when you're 93 you have all the desserts you want uh but uh like that like if i don't what i I learned a great point is either from sisson or rob wolf i don't know which but how i begin my day dictates my day to such a huge degree nutritionally and so if i begin eating you know i don't eat any glutens at all but uh, except maybe twice a year i'll go gluten-free pizza they've cracked the code on some of those crusts but yeah. i'll fuck with a regular thin crust too a couple times a year but i'll get there'll be a price to pay i'll get i'll get acid reflux really bad so i can't sleep and things like that. that's why i'm gluten-free is because i found i took gluten out and i don't have to take nexium anymore but um the, the thing with with feeding myself and with like what what part, part of my nourishing if i start eating you know before i was gluten free i started eating a bagel in the morning i need sugar every 2 hours yeah. like if i eat sugar it begets more sugar and so the more carbohydrates that i start with i can't i can't i literally cannot say no i don't have a mechanism yeah. in, in, so but if i i can't fight how do i fight that i stay nourished with fats and so the first thing that was my ally going into ketosis was coconut butter and anytime i had a it was fucking mark sisson and he dared me he goes go ahead and have yourself two tablespoons of coconut butter and and see if you're still hungry later and i was i'd get completely sated with these two i was like that's fantastic and so right. i started doing that and that kind of cracked the code for me like if i nourish myself correctly it makes a ketogenic diet easy. I don't yeah, even care if I eat yeah. again. Like, it's fine. Right. I have to force myself to my next, next meal a lot of the time. But that's right. if I do it appropriately and properly. And so, you know, the, I can't just fall into it. I have to be intentional, I guess, is my... Right. I heard uh, Mark Sisson also say, um, you know, he was like, if you really are just craving something like crazy and you're, you're just dying for something... He goes, go get some, uh, you know, go get some expensive dark chocolate. He's mm-hmm. like, ex- the more expensive, the better, because you're you're gonna value it more because it costs more, and you you only want to shell out so much dough for yep. it. He goes, go get yourself some nice expensive almond butter. He's like, take that chocolate, dip that in that almond butter. So great. And he said, just eat as much as you want. He's like, the he's like, it'll go away. You yep. know, he's he's like, you'll eat, you know, maybe I don't know, ten scoops of it or so, and. And that'll be that. And yeah, you won't it, have to do it again that, for a few months. You know, it's, so, it's over with. Right? Yeah. I, and I love that thing. And that's what got me through because I travel a lot, you know, and I can take these jars. They're not perishable. Right. You can take almond butter. You can take coconut butter. You can well, do those are things you got to prepare for because you know that sometimes so in your hotel room, especially if uh, the set or whatever sets you up with a nice hotel room and you're going to have uh, all these amenities, all these nice some things. peanut m ms maybe yeah and you're maybe a looking, bag of pringles yeah and you're just left with your own thoughts right yep <laughs> or you're on set for all day and all there is is snacks you know i mean even the sets you're, you're seeing healthier choices come up which is cool depends who number one and two on the call sheet are but th- there's some pretty fucking great healthy sets but also like always be prepared like i've and so that was the thing too is like it it's like it caused me to live my life have, having my diet in place 
allowed me to live my whole life more intentionally. It bled into my whole life because I, I had to, you know, I had to plan for it. And like, and I'd always kind of thought, I don't want the responsibility for my life. And if I planned for it, then the onus would be on me if it didn't work. Or I had some broken yeah. thinking about it, you know? And then when I just go, man, I just, I must, I cannot live this way anymore. So I must plan. So that would be the littlest bit I would do. And I would got these, I yielded these great results. And I was like, fuck this. I could do this with the rest of my life. The one thing is, is when you're in hotels and you're eating chocolate and almond butter, it's fucking good. But like, I usually that's before I go to bed, I'm watching, you know, NCIS on TV or Law and Order and I'm eating it. And then I kind of go to sleep or whatever. And you wake up and you go and you're like, fuck. And you got almond butter and chocolate melted into your sheets. And then you sit there and you're at the horns of a dilemma where you're like, am I late for the bus to go to work? And I try to clean the, or it's just the maids are going to think whatever they think when they you look at this mess on the, and, I'm, <laughs> and you just leave 10 bucks on it and walk off, I guess, you know, I don't know. <laughs> not what you think it is. You know, you want to be sure like you're not, it's not feces there. Yeah. It's just, I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a, here's the chocolate wrapper and the almond butter next to it. I didn't have an accident in the middle of the night, right? Which I've done before. When's the last time you had an accident like that? Oh. Uh, in your pants. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> well, in well in bed, you know. Uh, so I was <laughs> I was really, really sick. This was, a, this was like a Thanksgiving to remember for, for our whole family. Everybody got really, really sick. But I was the first one to get sick. I got sick. Um, I have a lot of uh, nieces and nephews and stuff, and you know they, you know how kids are. They they're little little bundles of germs, right? Uh, they came over a few days before we went on this trip, and I was just thinking, and I and I wished it upon myself. You know, I had the negative thoughts, so it was probably my own fault. But uh, I was like, man, these little bastards are going to get me sick. I think, and I'm always playing with them. I love I love them. I have so much fun with them. But uh, I was like, man, they're going to get me sick. Anyway, sure enough. You know, a day or two goes by, and I my stomach just start starts rumbling, and I start getting I start getting like deathly ill, and we're like leaving that day, so I'm like throwing up and shitting, like just it's just awful. I didn't know which end it was gonna come out of. It's the worst. <laughs> so I'm I just like annihilated our toilet, like it just sprayed all over the back of it, and it was like a lot of cleaning, and I just didn't even know where to begin. It was so bad, right? So I get done with that business and I go and sit on the couch and my stomach's just rumbling again. I'm like, oh my God, I got to go again. I can't even get up off the couch. I shit our couch. <laughs> what kind of pants you got on? I, I had sh I had shorts on. Like basketball shorts, I, loose, yeah. Well, it's even worse than that because I had shorts on and I took my underwear off because those were already like toast, you know? So I threw those in the, not to be revisited. I threw, I threw those away because I was like, they can't even not even salvageable. So I like actually shit like threw my shorts on the couch. <sighs> anyway, that couch was done. Like I told my wife, I was like, I can't explain what happened, but I was like, I threw out the cushion to the couch. I was like, it's just and we probably can't replace one cushion. So I was like, we need to, I was like, we need to get another couch, you know. Uh, then I went to the bathroom again and then I came out and I shit in our recliner and I'm like, this is just going to be so, I'm dying. Right. I finally feel better. And we, and we drive out to like Bodega Bay or wherever we were going for that Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, crappy again and I'm just like laying in bed and I'm shivering and I'm sick for the whole time it's that we're the there. Worst, man. And my uh my wife and my uh sister-in-law and everyone's having a great time everyone's drinking everyone's laughing and they're also cooking up like a lot of seafood so like i'm barfy and pooping and everything else and i'm i like seafood but like that's the last thing Under you want normal conditions yeah yeah they're made they got like crabs and oysters and all these different things out there and i'm smelling that and i just keep running to the bathroom and at this point it's just all it's all vomit right well, I get everybody in the house sick uh, over those over those few days. I kept telling everybody, like, I don't think people should come over the house. I, I'm, you know, <laughs> shitting and puking all over. I've the shit place. all the furniture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we gotta throw everything. <laughs> we gotta throw everything out. And so my uh, nieces and nephews got sick. My sister in law got sick. I don't think my wife got sick, but uh, I just remember the ride home. My we were following my uh, my brother in law home. 
and he pulls off and I was like, oh man, what happened to him? And he's just barfing on the side of the road. I was like, man, we just got just blasted this vacation. It was, it was brutal, but it makes for some, for a good story, I guess. I feel like that's, that's the last time I shit myself. In your adult life, how many times do you think it's happened? <clears throat> Probably about three times. Really? Yeah. Is that three like times too ass- many? I feel like my asshole's broken. I feel like I do it way more. Oh, like, I mean, you know, I got I'll deep- maybe shit in my pants maybe twice a year. Well, I say I got, you know, I got deep cheeks. I learned that from uh, John deep Anderson, a, 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 a bodybuilder. Yeah, John it, was exploring the cheek region or how did he know how deep your cheeks were? Well, no, he his own cheeks are deep. Oh, OK. So he said that uh, he said he was uh, just sitting there eating one day and this guy eats like 400 grams of protein every day or whatever. John just rips this just nasty, brutal fart at the dinner table. And his daughter, who's like 11, she's like, Dad, she's like, there's just no way that you didn't ruin your shorts on that. Like, there's just like, that was really bad. He's like, ah, oh. he's like, I'll go check. And he goes and he checks and he, he comes back and he tells her, he's like, honey, I got under control. Shorts are fine. He goes, I did need to wipe though. He goes, but luckily I got really deep cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> Enough surface area. So just- I think, <laughs> yeah, to where it didn't, it didn't really cause a problem. So I think I fall into that category as well. Yeah. Deep cheeks. I'm blessed. I guess Hashtag so. Hashtag blessed. And guys really got to <laughs> earn it if they want to get in there. They There's a lot to fight through. Yeah, that's yeah. right. There's You're not that. really built for that. No, I'm not built yeah. for that. No. Well, that's fortunate. It works out. Mine, I had I had peg leg jeans like jeans that were tighter at my calves. Oh no, not good. And then they were baggy at the top, though. All the farts trapped, which in seems too. good. But I was just driving across town in L.A., not sick or nothing. <laughs> you didn't even have an excuse. I got three stories. I got to get up, even have an elevator. Wait for that's brutal. It was one of those things. I was on the road for too long, and a lot of people <laughs> won't let you use the restroom in L.A. because it's yeah. just like there's homeless. Like people just they're not doing that. Well, they know guys like you that shit their pants I guess, and they come man, rolling in. I got up and it's just like, I don't know. I, they're not deep enough for sure. Because it feels like they just poke out and then it goes. And then it, it's like I have a keypad on my oh, door. Oh, like a real poop? Like a full-on poop? Dude, a keypad <laughs> on my door, four numbers. That's it. And you know, I see those people in the horror movies with the keys and they're like, fucking Michael's <laughs> coming and then they drop the key. You're like, who drops the keys? <laughs> Nobody drops keys. <laughs> right. But when you're all fucked up in your head and scared, maybe your keys drop, I guess. Because I'm punching those four numbers in that I punched in a thousand times before. <laughs> and you're way And they're off. not coming fast enough. And then I, and then it red X, and I'm like, and, 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 and a little boom. And like that, you feel it, you know, <laughs> it, it opens and then there's, and, and if everything's right at the door and it opens, stuff runs through the door, you know, like whatever. And then I go through again and I, <laughs> I get it and I open the door and there's like a, a it's like it's like being fatigued if you're working out and then you're like, I don't have one left for this tricep press. I don't have one left. Like there's no muscle to resist even 10 pounds of weight coming back. And it just, whoo. And so that's what happened in my um, rectum. And, uh, <laughs> and just filled those baggy pants up down to my calf where it caught. And now I have to walk across to my bathroom and then I'm at the dilemma of do I sit or do I? So I just went into the shower and took, the pants off Sometimes and i just let the only option. but it was goddamn horrific that you was still the, have the pants i do <laughs> i was gonna say you I, I'm, frugal. I'm frugal i'm frugal i you know yeah, i don't gotta, yeah i don't have all that slingshot money yet i gotta maybe wait until mine comes through and then i'll maybe just i'll be able to throw couches away <laughs> maybe, maybe those uh those pants are cleaner than ever now you never know well they did get cleaned up yeah they're white pants i just bleach them you know you know, uh, switching gears here for a second. Oh, thank God. You know, we you got, got too like deep uh, into that. You got, <laughs> we almost couldn't get away, couldn't get out of that. Uh, you got guys like Josh Brolin, you know, who has has had this uh, long acting career, right? But later on in life, uh, you know, now he's you know one of the one of the top guys. I mean, his movies are really are really hitting, he's right? Getting better and better. And, and you would have called him a superstar. 20 years ago and now better like it's amazing it's beautiful it's, and a beautiful guy it's it's amazing to watch right and, and the rock's not young either like the rock's gonna be yeah, what is almost he, 52 or something yeah he's like he's like 50 years old or something like that and how, how old are you uh 47 D- uh, is that is that something that you're stri- you're striving to do or do you uh like the roles that you're in or are you trying to oh of course i'm always wanting to get better reach higher you know and and uh in everything i don't i don't 
you know, the one thing that uh, that is uh, uh, characteristic that's similar through everybody that I know and that I hang out with a lot is that there's never this sense of I'm done, I'm complete, you know, and whatever it is oh, that yeah, someone's doing, they're trying to, you know, they're they're doing the next thing and. And people that are worried about doing the next thing of how to grow their capacity to be larger are not so, uh, whether it's gossipy or, or so much worried about what you're doing, they're, they're really focused on what they're doing. And it's really hard when you start to get into that kind of growth mindset, it's hard to live in your rear view mirror about like, oh, that thing that I did, it, it kind of becomes unimportant. I mean, of course, it's formed you to who you are yeah. and it's nice for reflection in some ways, but... A lot of times reflection becomes a, a, a maudlin reminiscence that can rob you of your future. And so um, to stay growing and all that, yeah, man, I, 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 that's what I'm endeavoring to do now. I just um, got this like a full acting part on, on NCIS, which is, which is dope. But I'm, I'm looking for more and more of that for sure. And I'm looking into uh, creation of, of film and art and, oh, cool. and painting. And like I just... Oh, that's awesome. Like, like all that stuff to me is just how do you enhance your growth more and more and more? And then how do you use that stuff to be able to help your community more and more and more? Because the more, you know, the, the more vibrant my community, the more I can stay. Like, I'm not uh, like a, a font of inspiration, you know? It's, uh, it's something that you need to nurture and, and you can't leave yourself without that. And so if I'm not continually trying to rip off the old kind of carcass of who I was and become who I I'm like going that, to yeah. be, I get stagnant. And and for me, it's like, you know, why look towards spiritual things or why look towards uh, growth in that aggressive kind of way that I do or anything like that is not to have a higher consciousness for the sake of talking or to not, like, it's to not kill myself. It's because I get so dissatisfied that uh, I get this nihilistic view towards life mm -hmm. and, like, what's the point of it all anyway? And if I'm not... That still look, happens. If I'm not looking, oh, if I'm not looking to suffer to grow, uh, and I, I I sink into my comforts, I'd rather kill myself. I'd rather like it, I, it becomes untenable to me. And I, when I say I'd rather, it's not like a thought, like an intellectual thought. It's like I cannot fucking bear life anymore. And and so I've been pushed into this growth for a long time of of going. I need it to have function and performance, man. And whatever it looks good or whatever the marketing is, I don't give a shit. I just need something that's going to fucking work. And, and that's what guys told me early on, too. They go with spirituality, man. They're like, you know, it seemed like this ephemeral thing that was just like at the wisps of your fingertips at best that they'd speak of. And this guy, I said, man, I need something I can grab. Hey, like, am I going to go chanting on top of a mountain yeah, with yeah. the wind blowing or something? Or what's going on? Right? And then a dude laid on me. He goes, 90% of a spiritual life, Tate, is having manners when you don't feel like it. Do it, do the right thing, regardless of how you feel about it. Like get into contrary action and just doing those simple things of like, get out of bed when the alarm goes off. Don't hit snooze. Like those are like ways to get up ahead of myself, you know, because there's that critic in me that I have to, I have to push the voice down. So it's really hard for you to deal with, uh, like not doing anything. So like you get the high of, uh, the movies, you get the high of getting a TV deal or, but those in between spots, I've got to well, be a little hard for you, right? Yeah, and I can't live on the high of the movies or any like I can't believe you the be good careful press and it. I can't believe the bad press. None of that right. shit matters to me. You know, Jumanji comes out, shit, that's my history. That happened a year ago. So my history is everybody else's present. You know, my mom is like looks at it when she's watching it with me and it's as if it happened today and it's like it's already like so the shine's often to some degree I'm still proud of it, fortunate to be there, all that kind of stuff, but yesterday's yesterday's uh sandwich doesn't feed me today you know yesterday's prayers aren't going to get me by into tomorrow type of thing and and so i have to i have to pay attention to these things these little ticks every single day and and if i don't and if i don't stay in motion of trying to better myself and that can look a lot a variant of ways i get into a darkness where i can't leave the house i don't want to get out of bed and i'm not going to answer my phone you know and 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 those kinds of things you know I, um a lot of people deal with that yeah and and it does social media in some ways make that better or worse? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think you. it makes it worse overall because people, people that don't deserve a voice, and you could cry and say everybody deserves a voice, yeah. but that's fucking gay. Uh, they don't. You know, people negative. don't merit yeah. a voice. There's a lot of negative reinforcement they just I don't. feel from. So here's a bunch of dudes that ain't done it. 
they're going to tell their opinion on people doing it. Eat dicks, man. Fucking right. you got zero to say, you know, and, and, and that whole kind of thing. I, I don't know. All the guys I ever trained in my gym or anywhere, I go, hey, uh, they all clamor after money. I need to make some money. Everybody want to make some money, you know? I know guys that got $50 million, and they're fucking bummed out that they don't have $60 million. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? It's like what if you're in this, uh, this, this addict kind of mindset, more is never enough. There's just not going to be enough. So I hope you get all the pussy, all the money, all the cars, all the jobs in spades so you can find out that ain't what you lack. And that, that becomes a thing. And the whole thing is your 20s, early 30s, that's to sharpen the sword, man. You're just sharpening the sword. You're building character, building skill sets. That's what that's for. Mm. Your money will come later if you've done good repetitions of, of building your character correctly. But you act shady. You got no integrity. Your fucking system breaks down all the time because you're following the next shiny fucking thing. You're going to be a scrub your whole life. You know, you got to stay true to something. And once you stay true to something and you can get excellent at that thing, that fucking shit bleeds into your whole life. And that will serve you. And then you'll know what other people did to get that excellence. And you'll be able to see that. And then you'll start to tonify yourself to where you vibrate. And those things are attracted to you because you're all speaking a common language of the heart. You never let your uh, guard down. And those other people don't ever know because they're just following. What? Oh, what did social media tell me is cool? Oh, is that cool now? Okay, cool. Fit T. I'll get some of that. Okay, cool. Oh, are you my online coach? How fucking gay is that? What are we doing here, people? That is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, goddamn! I love a lot of the people that I know on social media that slang some bullshit. Like you're like there, there's crazy. I mean, it's like here, here's uh, you know, candy and clouds for everybody, and it's like fuck. Wait, all of a sudden we're saying candy's the best thing for it. Like Halloween's our favorite thing, not just because they dress like sluts, but because we can eat fucking candy all day long, and <laughs> and everybody's dying of diabetes now because these are the thought leaders of the world. Are you fucking kidding me? It's ridiculous. Yeah. And so you get into that and you go, I need to have somebody that's got merit, that's walked the road that I can replicate. And they speak simple language, man. The, the, this other shit, like if it fits my math, I don't even know what all that shit means. I'm like, that sounds so gay. You're, great. You got, did you get a marketing word for it? Great. I'm glad your macros are fitting in your Levi's or whatever the fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what are we talking about? There's so much of that. <laughs> There's so much of that going around. And it's just, you know, people are, People are trying to promote, you know, a cause or promote, you know, their their own their own kind of agenda that's going on. But what I see with a lot of social media, I see a lot of bosses, yeah. I see a lot of hashtag bosses. Ain't nobody put their name on the bottom of nobody's check. You ain't sign anybody's checks. You ain't no boss, kid. Sorry, <laughs> you know, like that yeah, that's that becomes true. the deal. That's that's, that's very true. I, I see a, just a kind of a negative feedback loop, you know, because people want to they want to keep checking and seeing how many likes they got. How many comments they got. And then what do you actually do when you look at it? You always look at it. You're always dissatisfied. <laughs> and, and and you search for the one negative comment out of the 15. Hey, those are Tate, the ones we answer. Tate, you look great. You know, uh, can't wait to see you next week. And there's a bunch of those. Right. But it's the one guy who's like, man, you can't act for shit. Right. Like, that's the one you're hung up on. You don't even know and who I, the guy is. I formulate a really good response for him about well, how worthless his whole life is. You check him out and you click on it. his yeah. post of like, you know, and it's just... It can it can lead you down uh, a negative path a lot of times. It's not not an easy thing. To, None of it uh, feels good, right? It just doesn't. That stuff to. But I think addiction falls into that same realm where it's that feedback loop. That's you're, there you're, for sure. you're you're searching for results that you don't even ever actually want. Mm. How wild is that's that? That's interesting. Because you never get you never get that result. You're not looking for all the complimentary results. You're looking for the result that's one twat that's saying what? Yeah. But That's I think crazy. the same thing happens through addiction a lot of times. It's it's a result that you you know that you don't want that result. You right. know that that result is not good for you. Maybe I've heard you know I haven't really been high a lot in my life and stuff, so I don't have as much uh, that much experience with some of that stuff. But you know from what I hear is like you know nothing compares to the first or second time that you kind of go down that road and you never get back to there again anyway. Right. You ever and done then cocaine? disastrous shits. No, I never tried any of that stuff. That's the worst out of all that, out of all those, because it's like that takes you, you do your one bump and then you're here, but then it plateaus. You can do a fucking pile after that. You never go. It's just like you stay painfully at the same rate, which is just, it's the worst dick tease ever. You're but I think dying. that happens a lot in life. Of course. I think it happens a lot in life and, it, and you keep, you keep bringing that bell over and over again. You're like, why am I doing that? Yeah. 
the fuck am I doing? Yeah. I don't want that result. There's a there's a thing that does You got to make a change. It it doesn't it just doesn't make sense, but it's the same thing everywhere, right? Like how do we curate our lives? How do we watch ourselves? And how do we say, "Hey, I'm 100% responsible for my life." It's like uh, you know, the first thing that is the answer is you got to get out of the victim mindset. There's no victim ever grows. And and if you're looking for, you know, I used to be a guy that was like, "All I need is a scapegoat and I'm fine." You know what I mean? I need somebody to point the finger at and I'm okay. But like when you get into real self-improvement and you go, okay, I want self-consciousness and awareness uh, to be rising at a different vibration than me playing the blame game, then my life gets to get better. Because if the responsibility is yours to give me a nice chest, what, what time do I get a nice chest? The time I decide to do the work, like you can never build my chest for me, you know? Right. And it's the same thing with my emotional health. Like you're never you're never hurting nor helping my chest development as it were, you know, it's like you're either an example or not or whatever, but you're outside of the frame of that. And so to point and uh, assign responsibility, it doesn't make any sense. It's not, there's no function or performance there. And when I worry about the things that don't make me better, when I worry about the things that I have no control of, which is your behavior regarding me, if I spend all my time worrying about your behavior or worrying about the negative comment or worrying whatever, those are things that I cannot change that have nothing to do with me, except what it does is it makes me avoid me. It's the same problem we have of looking and going, ah, oh, the president's this way or, or France acts that way. or when, Anytime I'm pointing to something outside of me, I am now ignoring what I need to do to help me. And so like, you're, I'm only in my own way, I guess is my point. Yeah. So that becomes, that becomes the whole thing is... How do I get maybe out of my own way? Maybe that's why you think some of the life coach stuff is kind of bullshit, right? Not not life coach, but internet coaching, I think, is, right, is right. a little... It's it, it just seems like... You're talking about like, silly. like uh, programming, like uh, people no, there's programming, programming workouts I think that's and stuff? Great, but like, yeah, there's, there's, there's that life coach aspect. There's... Because I've seen more people from Everybody gets to be an expert, that. right? Right. Without any I see veracity. I see what Everybody gets to say, I am this, and there's no... You don't have any history of that, bro. Yeah, you know somebody's I mean? explaining this long thing of how they got somewhere, and you're like, "Where are you? I, I don't mean, even I've know seen where, where, where you've been." <laughs> on um, <laughs> on powerlifting, right? That are been doing completely it for a year. stolen, right? From Russian masters and reiterated here, <laughs> right. and then called. It, but I'm an expert, or whatever, or or, or put I na- name name a subject, you know, right, whatever right. it is. And then somebody is that, th- I'm a social media uh, marketing guru, and I could really help your company. And I go to their thing, and they've got 23 followers. And yeah. I think, maybe you're not that. Did yeah. you ever consider that? You know, wild? like all that thing is like, again, how do you separate the bullshit from the truth? You're like, I want to find something, but I need it to be nourishing. Well, and that's a lot where, of this uh, stuff isn't. That's where your background comes into play so much, because right. you've been around some real killers before. You got to walk a road. Yeah, I mean, you know? you you've uh, you know nowadays you're involved more in in fitness. You're involved in the ketogenic diet. You are you are friends with people that are in high places, so it makes it easier for you to see like these people are full of shit and doing all the sure. jujitsu and fighting and all the different things that you've been doing that are so physical. You can just tell when someone's full of shit mm-hmm. right I mean, away. It might not matter if you're training my mom in Krav Maga, whether your shit is bunk or not. Right. But it sure fucking matters if you're a fighter that's going to put your safety on the line. Right. Whether or not you're being sold a, a fraudulent bag of goods, which you may be. You know? Well, and sometimes it's just flat out annoying. Right. Right, because well, you're just like, this fucking... <laughs> it's like, get on the yeah. road. Just get on the road, man. Because, you know, we choose to be spectators when we're afraid to bleed a little bit, you know? And then, and, and then it's... Yeah, that spectator job, man, that's just... There's not, it's not a good look, you know? It's right. not something I'd enjoy to be. The sandwich you ate yesterday is not going <laughs> to feed you today. Uh, where can people find a Tate Fletcher? Tate Fletcher is easy to find. Just find me on uh, Instagram or uh, Caveman Coffee is there. You can uh, Tell me more about Caveman Coffee. I know we've talked about it a little <laughs> bit before on the podcast, but things seem to be rolling, th- rolling along really well with it. company that we uh, started a few years back, and um, we just were coffee lovers, and wanted there there wasn't any uh nitro cold brew coffee on the market and so we came up with this fancy little can and there was none put it nothing no 
I remember. We're, I remember we're when first. you guys get when you guys got it going. I was like, "This is fucking great" because yeah. there's nothing like it right now. And then we just we just started curating, uh, you know, beans from farms that we liked. We started relationships with different places. First in Colombia, and then we've got some out of Africa and Brazil. And uh, we're real careful with the roasts and the notes that we uh, are putting out. And we started basically be, as as the ketogenic diet started to take root in my life and uh that that whole kind of top end nutrition thinking um we just thought well let's put something out that we hadn't seen before really in the market and uh and that we use all the time and so it's something that we really believed in and that other people were like hey because I, I, i'd kind of had like a, a twitter um coffee club where mm -hmm. i would send coffee to guys and they would send just because i talk a lot about coffee and about single origin coffee and all that and then keith met um some roasters and these guys from Columbia, and then we kind of started talking to them and then we just started a page and started selling stuff and uh and then it kind of grew and it was i was a a reluctant entrepreneur i guess i was or i, well, I it was and, a, and in unintentional talking, in, in, in the way that it began yeah. and now that we've had to gain intention with it we've uh you know turned up the steam on that a little bit what he's trying to say is he tried to make a really cheap product because the margins were great <laughs> that couldn't so, be further from yeah, the truth right that's the craziest right yeah so you was, look this at is stuff. a hard product to make i mean it's a, a hard product to ship it's got it you mentioned it's got to be cold yeah and it's uh it's it's a nitro cold brew and it's the only which is different right? i think it's the only single origin cold brew that there is most people use blends because it's cheaper you can get a bunch of beans that you know, like you can hide the profile of it a little bit so we just only wanted the highest quality of stuff to use and all that it was impossible to get to to ship at room temperature because you'd have you'd run into problems with botulism or staff there's all right. kinds of things that can happen so any time you found a coffee like this like they'd have sugar or milk in it generally it wasn't just right. coffee and water and and now things are changing a little bit. Now we just found a a, a new way to produce it, cool. which will be unleashing in a month or so here. Awesome. Um, which we'll we'll send you some new stuff, and we'll be doing a, a bunch of different flavors and all that with it, which will be kind of a, a new kind of deal too, and a little bit of new tropic stuff with things. Uh, oh, nice! Working in some MCT and CBD uh, within the uh, K cups that we're we're putting out right now. We. You know, th that was another thing. K-Cups were a big market item for us, but there wasn't a way that they were biodegradable. And they even, even the guy that made K-Cups is like, he sounded like Oppenheimer after he made the bomb. He's like, I'm so fucking sorry that <laughs> like, I created whoops. all this waste everywhere. Yeah. He had, he's like, I just had no idea. I was just yeah. making this thing. And and so now they've got biodegradable K-Cups, so we're using those. And, and yeah, and, and all that shit's more, you know, it it is. It's all more expensive, you know? It's like... Uh, but I was, never excuse, I was never really into having the cheapest widget on the block either. I want, you know, I want to be able to stand by what we put out. And so the minute we can't do that is the minute we won't do that anymore. But um, Thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate yeah, having you again. You. Strength is never weakness. Weakness never strength. See you guys later.